What we find in the story is sure enough, Abraham and Sarah do have a son. When Sarah is 90 and Abraham's 100, they have Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. You know what we have here is a baby, baby nation of just a couple people, a very small family. Esau didn't want to wait for the promises to be fulfilled. He sells his birthright, which would have included the promise cards. Well, these aren't of use to me. He sells them to Jacob for a pot of stew that he can smell and see and taste. In other words, I don't want to wait for this. I want what I can see and taste and touch right now. And literally what Esau got was gone 24 hours later. He had given up something that was going to last for a long, long time in exchange for something very temporal. And then we have Jacob has the promise cards. God's going to build the nation through Jacob. So we double click out of the two sons. So we have all the nations. Let's just quick review all the nations. And we have this one man, Abraham, that God's going to make a nation. Double click on Abraham. Then we have Ishmael from the handmaid. And we have Isaac from Sarah. Double click on Isaac. Then we have two, these twins, totally opposite from each other, Esau and Jacob. Who, would, who do we click on in the story? Double click on Jacob. We're going to follow his storyline. He has 12 sons by four women. So you can imagine how much conflict was in their family. <laughs> this was a blended family that didn't blend real well because they were always at each other. And you see that one second to the bottom, Joseph? He was the firstborn son of the favorite wife. And his brothers hated him. And they sold him down to Egypt. Good riddance is what they thought. And what happened was Joseph rose to the prominent position. And then when famine came, he said, listen, I can provide for you down in Egypt. Everyone moved down to Egypt. So Abraham's little family now has 70 people in it. We have a baby, baby nation. They moved down to Egypt. And over those next 400 years, like God had said to Abraham, they become enslaved. When 400 years is up, what did God tell Abraham? They're going to come back to the land. I promise they will come back to this land. And Pharaoh of Egypt says, I'm not letting them go. We have a series of plagues. And on the 10th plague, God tells Moses, He'll let them go on this one because I'm going to take, it's the plague of death, and I'm going to take the firstborn of everyone. Now, this would fall on the Israelites as well. But this is what God told the Israelites. Take a lamb, and on the 14th day of the month, and the when is very important. When, the 14th day of the month of Nisan. That's a, on the Jewish calendar. They used a lunar calendar, and so it changed. Sometimes it's in March, sometimes it's in April. That's why I'm using the Hebrew name. On the 14th day, at twilight, kill the lamb, take the blood, and put it onto the doorpost and the lintel. God's telling them to do this. And then he says, when I see the blood on the doors, I will pass over that son, that firstborn son. And do I have any firstborn sons in the room right now? Okay, so it's your life on the line. <laughs> Can you imagine having your dad put that on the doorpost and saying, it's getting dark. You know that you are going to be set free from this slavery. Your bags are packed. You are ready to go. All of the Israelites, all of this nation now is about two, two and a half million people by this time. And they are going to be set free to go back to the land that was promised to Abraham. So you're waiting and it's dark. It's about 10 o'clock and you say, Dad, did you put the blood on the door? Son, you saw me put the blood on the door. Do you think we better double check? <laughs> it's your life. And then at midnight you hear the cries from the Egyptian homes down the street. And you realize death is coming just as God said it would. And you wait. And then you hear it down the street, the homes that don't have the blood on the door. Death, you will surely die. They are dying. 
And you know what has just happened? You have been passed over. Because when God saw the blood on that door, he knew a life has already been taken. There has been a substitute that has paid for this one. A death has already occurred. That's where the Jewish holiday of Passover originates. When this happens, Pharaoh says, leave, just get out of here, just go. God takes this nation and he takes them back to the land that he has promised to Abraham. Here's point A, where they are in Egypt. Here's point B, Canaan, where they're going. What is the fastest way between two points? Straight line. In fact, there's actually a highway from ancient times as well as modern. It's called the Coastal Highway that follows that route right there. And God said, my people are not ready for the job I have for them to do in Canaan. If they go this route, they're not going to be ready. So he takes them. After they cross the Red Sea, they go south into the wilderness. And it's a time of testing and training because getting to Canaan is not the goal. They have been set free so that they can be God's people. They're the descendants of Abraham. And God wants to take that nation and say, this is how you live as my people. Let me train you. So he takes them into this time of testing to teach them his ways. And he takes them all the way down to Mount Sinai. And he gives them, at Mount Sinai, he gives them his law. The Ten Commandments. He refers to it as a marriage agreement, as a marriage covenant. Will you have this God to cherish, to have and to hold, forsaking all others? What's the first command? You shall have no other gods before me. Do you hear that? This is like a marriage agreement between God and his people now. And he's saying, you are my people. I bought you with the lamb that was up in Egypt at Passover. You're mine. And I'm going to take care of you and look, this is how I want you to live. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven images. You shall not take my name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. And don't covet anything from your neighbor. And when the people, they're terrified hearing this, it was cloudy and it was booming voice and it was thundering and lightning and they're terrified. They've just seen this God take out all of the Egyptian crops and economy. And now he's thundering and saying, you obey me. And what does he want from them? What response? Yes, I will believe you and I will do what you say. Well, they are so terrified. They say unanimously, all that the Lord has said, we'll do, we'll do. Okay, so Moses, they said, Moses, can you just talk to God on our behalf? This is terrifying. We can't handle this. This is too scary. So Moses goes to talk to God and get the rest of the instructions. While Moses is gone, you know what they do? They make this golden calf an image and say, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. You know what that's like? That's like committing adultery on your honeymoon. This is not even 40 days after they've gotten this command. I lived overseas for a while, and a young Muslim woman and I were talking. She's a delightful young woman. And we started talking about God's law. And she said, why would God give us a law that he knew we couldn't keep? Have you ever wondered that? It was such a great question. 